Coming up, a new record. She's 19 and she's flown around the world. Learning to fly gyros in Costa Rica and the latest military technology born out of general aviation technology. That and more when AOPA Live This Week begins in just a moment. I remember developing A20 and thinking, is this as good as it can be? Can I make it better? You can't have the mindset that it's impossible to make it better. If you're already at that mindset, you might as well go home. This is AOPA Live This Week with Alyssa Cobb and Paul Harrop filling in for Tom Haynes. A new record, and this one is quite a feat. Zara Rutherford is the youngest woman to circumnavigate the globe and the youngest person to fly solo around the world in a European ultralight aircraft. That's right, and in addition to her two Guinness World Records, she also has become the first Belgian to fly around the world alone. This is footage of Zara making a formation flight with the Belgian Air Force's Red Devils and a celebratory low pass prior to completing her circumnavigation. After 155 days of VFR only flying, weather delays, pandemic complications, and visa hang up, she's finally made it. She departed on August 18, 2021, and she faced a number of significant challenges, including having to be just 600 feet over the ocean an ocean and then worrying about straying into North Korean airspace. I talked with her at the halfway point a few months ago and she said the shark was a perfect pick for her journey. So I'm flying uh, a shark, so it's a microlight, as you said. It is the fastest microlight in the world, so it was a relatively easy decision to make. It's also very safe, um, efficient fuel-wise, and it's been great. It's been, I mean, I'm halfway around the world and I'm, I'm really happy with it gets me to places relatively quickly, but then I also get to enjoy the views. You can read more about her epic journey on our website, and you can also listen to more of my interview with her when she was stuck in Alaska. Just search for the Hangar Talk podcast, episode 135. Now, she may not have flown around the world, but flight instructor Amber Peterson has a lot to brag about. She is recognized as the Great Lakes Regional Best CFI in the AOPA Flight Training Experience Award. Amber is four years into her second career as a flight instructor. She earned her CFI as a way to build hours, but then fell in love with teaching. I love helping people's dreams come true. That sounds really cliche, yet that is my job. Um, everybody that walks through that door they've wanted to do it since they were a little kid, or that's what they want to do for a career. So I'm able to take my skills, my experience and help them achieve that dream. And nothing is better than seeing somebody come back on their first solo with tears in their eyes or that huge bear hug after they pass their ride. It's, it's absolutely the best thing, helping them achieve their dreams. Well, Amber, I can definitely identify with that. Now, Amber is an independent flight instructor in the Minneapolis area. Well, De Jess Patton is our best CFI in the Northwest Mountain region. Now, he's a CFI at Ridgeline Aviation in Montana. Jess goes above and beyond to make sure his students feel confident both in the air and on the ground. He loves sharing his passion to fly with the next generation of pilots. I used to coach a little bit, and so seeing people succeed in something that I enjoy doing so is just a fun experience for me. Um, and so I love, you know, developing someone from the very beginning of their training to watching them master it and become a flight instructor themselves. Um, it's just a really cool accomplishment and a cool feeling to have watching that grow. Well, congratulations, Amber and Jess. We'll have more on the Regional Best Flight Schools later in the show. Well, even if you learned to fly a long time ago, it's important to challenge yourself and try something new every once in a while. AOPA senior content producer Ian Twombly stepped out of his comfort zone and learned how to fly a gyroplane in Costa Rica. This is a gyroplane, and today we're in Costa Rica, which is a perfect place for something as slow as this, open cockpit, and a heck of a lot of fun. And thanks to the pandemic, I did something I never thought I would do and learned to fly one. I learned to fly at Fly With Us, a father-son operation at the Autonuez Airport on the country's central Pacific coast. From the first lesson, Dad Frank made it clear that this is a professional operation. The pre-flight briefing was thorough, methodical, and highly detailed. Since most of their customers are Spanish speakers, I had to translate the checklist into English. It was a great exercise in learning the ins and outs of the gyro. 
This is an MTO Sport from Autogyro in Germany. It's powered by a Rotax 912 ULS engine. I had always considered Rotax really only sport engines, but flying in front of one for more than 20 hours now, I'm convinced it is a better, more modern experience for pilots. There's no mixture, cold or hot starts, and managing temps is like managing temps in a car. You basically forget about it. Simplicity is a theme in the gyro. The two-blade rotor system is constantly in auto rotation. So other than pre-rotation, for takeoff. There's no transmission, drive shafts, or really any connection to the engine that can fail. It just sits up there spinning away by its happy self. As a transitioning pilot, most of the training centers around ground handling and differential flight characteristics. Not quite helicopter, not quite airplane. The gyro is sort of like if the two had a baby. The controls are traditional airplane, but they move a rotor, similar to a helicopter. There is a horizontal and vertical stabilizer, a controllable rudder, but no elevator. Pitch is controlled through power changes and changing the angle of the rotor disc. Pre-flight done, it's time to fly. I did most of my training with Son Nicholas, an experienced instructor in his own way. Taking off in the gyro is completely different from an airplane. First, you must get the rotor turning prior to the takeoff run, and that means a minimum RPM. This is done with the pre-rotator, which in the MTO is a hydraulic cylinder that tightens a belt to the engine drive shaft and then transfers that energy to a pinion that goes into a ring gear, turning the rotor. It's like an elaborate starter for an airplane. When you're ready to go, release the pre-rotator, pull back on the stick, add full power, and hang on. In the air, the gyro behaves a lot like an airplane except for two key areas. The giant disc above your head is a massive chunk of drag, so power leads all altitude changes. And more importantly, air must always be coming from below the rotor for the auto rotation to continue. Push negative Gs and your day will become lousy and fast. It also lands fairly conventionally, although there are ground handling concerns. Here Nicholas is flying and you can see how short the landing is but also that the stick must come forward as soon as you're stopped and under control, the rotor brake is then applied. Make sure the rotor is always into the wind, taxi slow, make sure you fly it to the parking spot, and you'll be fine. Ian Twombly, AOPA Live. You can read more about gyro flying in the February issue of AOPA Pilot Magazine. Well, Instrum Helicopters is bankrupt, the company declaring Chapter 7 liquidation and shuttering after more than 60 years. Although a focus on foreign fleet sales hurt its business during the pandemic era, the root cause no doubt rests with Instrum's most current owner, the Chong Qing General Aviation Industry Group. Instrum has produced more than 1,300 helicopters since its humble beginnings in founder Rudy Instrum's garage in the late 1950s. In recent years, the bulk of sales went to foreign military and public safety outfits. Former head of sales and marketing Dennis Martin said the Chinese company bought Enstrom and then never really supported it. It hurt a lot of people. You know, at the end there, there was about 30 people. Um, uh, we, we've been sort of progressively winding things down. To, to be honest, we sort of saw this coming. Um, and we've been progressively sort of sort of uh, closing, closing different parts of the company down. Uh, you know, two years ago, we had 150 people. So, um, you know, this this does impact quite a few. Well, as for the future, there's a strong opportunity for parts sales to the existing fleet. There have been several potential suitors calling, but the whole thing has to go through bankruptcy court, and who knows how long that could take. Current instrument owners are encouraged to turn to their service centers for parts needs. The National Transportation Safety Board is pushing the FAA to require carbon monoxide detectors in general aviation aircraft. They point to 31 accidents between 1982 and 2020 attributed to carbon monoxide poisoning. 23 of those accidents were fatal, killing 42 people and seriously injuring four more. Now, the gas is odorless and colorless and can enter the cabin many different ways. The board first recommended the FAA require them back in 2004. The FAA just recommends pilots install them on a voluntary basis. Now they have issued a safety recommendation report about them. And in that, the board also asks AOPA and EAA to address the issue with members. The FAA safety team has a webinar coming up on carbon monoxide that you might want to tune into. 
It's on Friday, February 4th, and you can find it on the FAA, the FAST website. It's eligible for WINGS credit. Now, a loss for the airshow world and really aviation at large, Jacqueline Jackie B. Warda has passed. Warda, a world-renowned aerobatic performer, lost her battle with lung cancer on January 26th after being diagnosed just one month ago. Warda, who learned to fly at 32, launched her solo aerobatic career at the age of 50 in a pit special. Although some of her earliest memories were attending air shows with her father, Warda pursued a white-collar career until she was able to afford flight training. Now, Warda was also a motivational speaker and advocate for women in aviation through her involvement in female pilot organizations. Her tagline, Fly Like a Girl, inspired thousands. Now, in addition to flying, anyone connected with Jackie on social media knew that she was passionate about helping pets and was also an outspoken animal lover. Many are taking to social media to remember her. Well, in happier news, try this name on for size, the Mojave Air and Spaceport at Rutan Field. The board in charge of KMHV has voted to add the name to the field Bert and Dick Rutan helped make famous. Bert started the Rutan Aircraft Factory there in the 70s and scaled composites in the 80s. Both companies led directly to the private space industry. Dick, of course, is legendary for being the pilot of Voyager, the first non-stop around-the-world flight, as well as piloting Spaceship One. The brothers are credited with leading to the success of that airport, and now it is named in their honor. A very fitting honor, uh, I should say, Alyssa. I have had uh, the chance to fly in there with my friend Evan and his tripe baser, and the whole time I was just going on about, wow, this is where Bert did this, that, and the other. And uh, I'm, I'm such a fan. I can say I would not be sitting in this seat if it weren't for his design. Starship absolutely uh, inspired me to become a pilot. So thanks, Bert. That's right. That is your favorite, isn't it? By far, by far. Ask anyone yeah. that I've ever spent any time with. I don't shut up about it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> speaking of innovation, when we come back, certification for a flying car. And a look at how Tamarack's active winglets help special forces. There are many important things to consider before purchasing an aircraft. Let the experts at Aerospace Reports help guide you through the process. We combine expert knowledge with our long-standing commitment to personalized customer service to perfect your transaction. Learn more at aerospacereports.com. Welcome back. Look, up in the sky, it's a plane, it's a car, it's, well, both. And it's officially certified. The Klein Vision Air Car has just received an airworthiness certificate from the Slovak Transport Authority. It's flown some 70 hours to prove its uh, compliance with the European Aviation Safety Agency standards. Meanwhile, the company is working on a new model that they say will fly some 600 miles at 160 knots. Certification of that model is expected within 12 months. And Joby Aviation took to Twitter to announce what it claims is the fastest flight of an electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft to date. The tilt rotor craft hit 178 knots, according to the company. Now, previously, the company had claimed the longest flight of an EV toll on a single battery charge at nearly 155 miles. Joby expects to get its air taxi certified in 2023 and start service as a short-haul air carrier in 2024. That looks cool. Well, backcountry flying is quite popular, and if you're looking for some quality flight training to get you going, check out Ridgeline Aviation in Montana. It's where CFI Jess Padden teaches, one of the instructors featured earlier in the show. Ridgeline is the Flight Training Experience Awards Best Flight School in the Northwest Mountain Region. The school offers a number of options like tailwheel and backcountry training. School founder Grayson Sperry quit his job as a chemical engineer to start the business. I had this vision to provide um, high quality instruction for a reasonable price and and to be honest and tra transparent about it a lot of the flight training is centered around university go 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 you're done your airlines no one was able to provide high quality instruction to anyone who was not going through one of those programs so that's where the vision started, and I said, there's a huge underserved market. We want to start there, and we want to provide niche instruction. Ridgeline now has several types of airplanes, including a Super Cub. They have two locations, one in Bozeman and the other 
in Billings. And if you're in Chicagoland, check out Blue Skies Aviation Flying Service. Blue Skies is our best flight school in the Great Lakes region. It's located at Lake in the Hills Airport. The flight school offers a fun, friendly environment in which to learn to fly. We, we've just always made sure that people were welcome to just hang out if this is what they want to do is just hang out at the airport. This was the place they could do it. You know, we tried to stay away from being such a stiff business atmosphere and and just allow people to be here and shoot the breeze and, you know, hang out and that kind of stuff along with the flight train that we do and stuff. I mean, we take that very serious, but we also just try to be very welcoming. So, I, I mean, I like to think we've got a, it's, it's really about the, the people here, the, the, all the instructors are, are great. Everyone has a little bit different style, but, uh, the thing that they have in common is everyone cares about the students. Well, from the regional winners we featured over the last couple of weeks, one flight school and one instructor will be recognized as the best in the country. We'll honor all the Flight Training Experience Award winners and announce those two national winners at Redbird Migration in Lakeland, Florida, February 8th and 9th. General Aviation is at a watershed moment. That's the warning from the heads of two major GA organizations the National Business Aviation Association, and AOPA. Speaking during a webinar last week, AOPA President Mark Baker reminded viewers that already two California airports have banned 100 low lead, the only fuel safe to use in about a quarter of the piston engine aircraft that are flying. In uh, Reed Hill View and uh, South, uh, South County San Martin Echo 16, there is no longer availability and no replacement of 100 low lead. And, and well, we all agree, and we'll go into more depth here with Ed and I, about we need to move away from even this low lead, one gram or two grams per gallon of lead in this fuel. Um, from a safety perspective, we're very concerned, and the FAA is now standing up. I, you know, when you look at this issue, uh, it falls under multiple titles. This is uh, an airport issue. It's an economic issue. Uh, it's a sustainability issue. Uh, but as you pointed out, first and foremost, it's a safety issue. What we are working on is to make sure that we have an opportunity to make a thoughtful, smooth transition uh, when we have a, a an, an alternative uh, that is that is a, a drop in that is available that we have the distribution and so a lot of work to be done. We are committed to a change and hope to get the whole industry to agree that the change will come in in a, in a timeline that makes sense so that we can protect the airports. And we're working with everybody all the way up through the Department of Transportation Secretary to make sure we can get the involvement. And if we need to involve Congress in this, we're going to have to, to make sure we all agree we're going to change away from this uh, low lead fuel as soon as practical, as soon as safe, as soon as economically feasible to do that. Well, Baker said that within a couple of months, the industry may have a solid timeline and a path toward a lead-free aviation fuel. And there's a big push in the industry to burn less fuel or to convert to electric. While many companies are working on new airframe or power plant designs, Tamarack Aerospace is focused on modifying the existing fleet. AOPA editor at large Tom Horn has more. Fuel economy, speed, and range have always been key goals in maximizing wing design. Tamarack Aerospace Group's strategy to achieve these goals is to make aftermarket wing modifications for some of the more popular airplanes in the turbine-powered general aviation fleet. This includes the smaller Cessna Citations and the King Air 350 series. They do it using what Tamarack calls their ATLAS modification. ATLAS stands for Active Technology Load Alleviating System. ATLAS is a technology that um, senses load and other flight conditions and then deploys depending on how much load it needs to take off of the wing. So you can do this extension and, and these devices are in position very quickly in a gust or in a maneuver they stay up and they unload the wing so you don't have to reinforce the wing. The retrofit adds a wing extension to the standard wing assembly along with a specially designed winglet. And what happens is we extend the range, extend the endurance by a, a lot reduce the stall speed, increase the gross weight potentially if the gear is not the limiting factor, and increase the max zero fuel weight. So all these things together, are, it's, a, it's a win for us. The Citation winglets are designed for the civilian market, 
while the King Air 350 winglets, for the time being, are for military intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance missions. The airplane shown in this video is a C-12, a military 200 series King Air, and it's the flight test airplane for Tamarack's 350 mod. So the market for the military version of this is somewhere between four and 600. We know for civilian there's a lot more, but we're not focused on the civilian market right now. Despite the popularity of their mods, Tamarack has encountered difficulties. Tamarack equipped airplanes were involved in several uncommanded roll events, one of them resulting in a fatal accident. The NTSB ruled that the active winglets somehow caused the fatal crash, but Tamarack strongly disagrees and says that the active winglets were fully operational and did not contribute to the accident. The company asserts that malfunctions in the AHARS, Attitude and Heading Reference System, may be to blame. Despite the challenges, the company is optimistic about the future. No, it's just an exciting time. You know, sustainability is number one right now in all the aviation communities all around the world for both civil civilian and and commercial and even the military. So we have a solution right now. That's, it's, it's kind of exciting to be in this space. We're almost like the poster child for that because we can increase the efficiency dramatically on an, on an older plane. This plane's a 1979 plane and it has an hour and a half more endurance than it did uh, a month ago before we put the winglets on. So it's kind of cool. Tom Horn, AOPA Live. You can read more about Tamarack in the January turbine issue of AOPA Pilot Magazine. Well, that's it for our show this week. Thanks for joining us. We'll send you out this week with a bit of weather-appropriate revelry. It's that time of year, time for the weirdos who actually enjoy the cold to go out and play. Hey, at last check, the Alton Bay, New Hampshire ice runway was getting very close to opening. They're about an inch away as the farther last update. And our friends at EAA are hosting the Winter Flight Fest on February 12th. And my friend Rich Wellner closes us out this week with some video of him flying his mall around on skis on purpose in the snow. He's even been out camping in this stuff. See oh. more from him by searching Rich Wellner on YouTube, and we'll see you next week. Stay warm.